to um, have uh, to introduce today uh, mm -hmm. Professor Henriette Elvan. Um, she's uh, since uh, recently, since a year ago, the Arthur F. Thorna Professor at the Department of Physics at the University of Michigan, where she has been a, a professor for the uh, last 11 years. Um, Henriette did uh, her PhD at the University of uh, California at Santa Barbara uh, on uh, new black holes in string theory, uh, a trendy um, uh, topic these days. Um, she uh, was a Papalardo Fellow, um, so a postdoctoral fellow uh, in physics at the MIT, and also a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Institute for Development Studies at Princeton. Uh, where she also spent some time afterwards visiting as a, as a visiting member of the IES uh, in Princeton. And Riet uh, is a fellow um, uh, of the American Physical Society since 2018. Uh, she has won many awards uh, and among those is the 2016 Maria Goepermeyer Award of the American Physical Society uh, and also um, the 2015 Henry Russell Award from Rackham Graduate School at the University of Michigan, which recognizes faculty early in their academic careers who already have demonstrated an extraordinary record of accomplishment in scholarship, research, and creativity, and have also demonstrated excellence as a teacher. So obviously, um, most of you know, um, Henriette is uh, an expert uh, in quantum field theory, gravity, supergravity, and string theory. And today um, she will uh, give us uh, a very intriguing presentation, interesting presentation on modern explorations of theoretical physics. And just quoting a bit of, uh, uh, to be more precise, so, so what she says is there is a wide range of physical phenomena from boiling water to pine scattering that can be described theoretically in a common mathematical language that is quantum field theory. And today she will uh, tell us a bit about these ideas and give examples uh, for, for applications uh, that range from ferromagnets to nonlinear electrodynamics and quantum gravity. So without further ado, Henriette, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Let me share my slide share. You should be able to see. All right, so hopefully that is visible and you can see in here. So let me stop it before it runs away here. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to see familiar faces again. And it's uh, just a shame that we can't see each other in person and talk more. Um, but hopefully there'll be another opportunity at some point in the future where taking the train to Chicago will feel like a normal and safe thing to do again. So I want to take you on a trip today on a hike into a landscape of theoretical physics. And I hope I will show that it has a wide range, as Marcella said, of applications, both within the particle physics context and outside. So here's a map. We're going to go on a hike. So we should consult with a map. This is a, ma a map that shows a mountainous region in Colorado. This is the peak of Mount Massa, where you can go on a beautiful hike up this path to one of these 14ers and look at the beautiful view from there. Now imagine that every point in this map is not just a little rock on the slope of a mountain, but it's actually a point that represents some theory. It could be some theory that is something measurable in nature, or it could be some theory that is more abstract and outside our reach of experimental testing. One example, could be that this point here on this particular slope represents our standard model of elementary particles with its three generations of quarks and leptons, the force carriers, and the Higgs. Now, why do I put it on a slope? I put it on a slope to illustrate in analog with the mountains that it depends on energy, the, this model. So it lies on a slope. And so, for example, if I go down this slope, then I know I can no longer pair produce the very heavy particles in the standard model. And if I go deep, 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 deep down where I can't even pair produce electrons and positrons and I forget about neutrinos and all such things, I end up deep, deep in the infrared with something that is basically just free photons flying around, some free Maxwell theory. On the other hand, when I go up in energy beyond where we have probed things now, 
at high energy acceleration, accelerators such as at the LHC. We don't know exactly which path we're following and what we'll get. Will we see something where dark matter is, is axions? Is we see something where there are new heavy particles? Will we see a path where there's supersymmetry? Will we see sterile neutrinos? We don't know what we're gonna see and exactly which path we follow as we go up. But we know something about where we are and we know that other models that could lie over here could be some completely different things with say 28 different generations of matter or we could have some color group in the uh, quantum chromodynamics with five different colors instead of the three that we're familiar with. We've got many different properties and many different parameters and completely different masses from what we're used to. We could have many Higgses, who knows? But you might say, who cares about all that? Because all I care about is finding out just this little area around the standard model above the slope of that, because I want to do the things that are relevant for our, our world, our universe. But I want to try to argue that in this space are many different options for theories. It's relevant to understand what else is out there. So two examples of relevant points in this space of many different kinds of very distinct theories are points of the that corresponds to theories that describe physical, physical things such as critical phase transitions in boiling water or critical phase transitions in helium-4. They lie somewhere in this space and they represent very different physics from the standard model, but physics that you can go out and test in the lab. So I want to describe the space and I want to try to give you an idea of what kind of methods people are using and the type of results that you can go after. And I also wanted to say, feel free to interrupt at any time and ask questions. Uh, and I would also be very happy to discuss with anybody after the colloquium too. So what do I mean by this theory space? So what I have in mind is the space of quantum field theories. What is that? So quantum field theory is a mathematical language of theoretical physics, and it's used widely across many different areas of physics, particle physics, condensed matter physics, cosmological models, statistical physics, and so on. One thing I want to emphasize that when we say quantum field theory, we don't mean just some one quantum field theory. There are many quantum field theories. In fact, there are so many that the space of possible quantum field theories is something that you can regard as a landscape that is wild and vast. And we know little bits and pieces of it here and there, and we know something about how to move around in this space, but we don't have a complete topographical map that you would want as when you go hiking and want to know what places are the dangerous ones and how to get home safely. So one of the goals in modern theoretical physics and a major thrust is to explore, explore the space of quantum field theories. And to do so using an increasingly sophisticated and powerful set of methods and tools. <clears throat> so when we go hiking in a real mountainous landscape, we really like to know to have where, where the peaks are and where the valleys are, where the lakes are and which kind of rivers we need to cross to get there. So peaks, valleys, ridges, saddle points, those are in some sense the light beacons. Those are the places where you can navigate by if you know them well. In the language of quantum field theory and in this landscape, those valleys and peaks metaphorically correspond to a class of theories that are called conformal field theories that I'm going to explain a bit more about as we go. But that is just to give you a sense that peaks and valleys are special points in this landscape of theories, just as they are in, our real, in a real landscape. So how, what, why, what do people do? Uh, in this talk, I want to focus on two different avenues of quantum field theory landscape explorations. One is called the conformal bootstrap, and the The second method that I will talk about is an amplitude space method where we explore the slopes of this landscape and also some special peaks. There are many different approaches to study these theories. Uh, you have many very, very skilled people at exploring these theories also at Chicago uh, who use some methods like this, but also others to explore this landscape. 
The stuff about conformal bootstrap is not my own work, but I'll present some other people's work for the completeness of the story. And what I've worked on myself more is the amplitude based methods. So again, I want to give you a flavor of each, but first there's something else that we have to do. So Marcella mentioned that I was a postdoc at MIT and at MIT as a Pavlada fellow, you participated in weekly lunches with other people from other fields. And one of the things they would always ask a theorist, or I would ask everybody, was what are you working on? But then they would always ask, what is it good for? And can I go out and see it in my lab? And I learned that I had to, very early on to, to find answers to those questions and describe it. And that was very hard at the time because I was working on five dimensional black holes. And every time I had to say, no, no, these kind of black holes you can't do in the lab, I'm sorry, but they're very interesting. But what I'm going to describe here is something that can be measured in the lab. And I want to try to give you a very clear example of this. So here's a phase diagram that we show students when we teach thermodynamics. It's the phase diagram of water. And our familiar place of living is at one atmosphere pressure. We see pressure on the vertical axis and temperature on the horizontal in humanly well-defined units at degrees Celsius. So at one atmosphere or pressure, we know well that water freezes at zero degrees and boils at 100 degrees. And if I go to the top of Mount Massive, I'm very high up and the pressure drops. And you know that you can feel that on your body. But if you try to cook on the top of the mountain, you also realize that the boiling temperature of water drops. And you have to cook your pasta for a longer time in order for it to be edible. On the other hand, if I, if I go up in pressure, then I see that the boiling point of water increases. And it increases up to a point where there's no longer a phase transition between the liquid phase and the gaseous phase. There's no distinction between the two at a pressure that is greater than 217 atmosphere. At the critical point, something very interesting happens and that's one of the things we will talk about. Now, below the critical point, as I cross the phase from liquid to gas with phase transition, it requires energy. We know that as the latent heat, what I have to put into my, my water for my coffee in order to make it boil. But as I increase and go up towards this critical point, I no longer have that discontinuous aspect of the phase transition. In fact, the phase transition becomes continuous. It goes from being first order to be a continuous phase transition, also called the second order phase transition. Now what happens at this critical point is very interesting. Before I get to the critical point, there's a characteristic length in the system. But toward the critical point, that characteristic length diverges. So the system no longer has a characteristic length scale of stereochemistry length of how fluctuations in the system interact with each other. The system, so to speak, becomes scale invariant. Now this is a physical effect that you can observe. And this is a Wikipedia picture in the bottom corner here that shows this precisely for, not for water, but for the substance called ethane. The reason it is ethane, I'll, I'll just mention in a second. What you see here in figure one is the clear two different phases. We're below the critical point where you have a liquid phase and a gaseous phase, and you see the little line between the two separating them. In the third picture, you're above the critical point, and there's no distinction between what is liquid. There's no little line that distinguishes the two. And right at the critical point, you see that the substance in there has the so milky texture, and that's because as the correlation length diverges, at some point the fluctuations in the system are the same order wavelength of light, and what used to be transparent to, to your visual, to optical light, now becomes this thing that interacts with everything and you get this milky substance. Now the reason this is shown for Ethan, I suppose, is because that has a much more humanly nature uh, in terms of in terms of where the critical point lies it lies at around 32 degrees celsius and 48 atmospheres so uh, that makes it much more uh, applicable for lab experiments than water per se now the critical length diverges but it also diverges in a particular way as the temperature approaches approaches the, the temperature of the critical point it approaches with this kind of power law where the power coefficient here is called the critical exponent. 
And for a liquid gas phase transition, the value of that critical exponent is 0 0.63, approximately. This has been measured in multiple different substances, including, in fact, heavy water through some neutron scattering experiments. But as far as I know, it's only been measured indirectly in regular water. If anybody knows anything of a direct measurement of, of, of this coefficient nu in water, I would very much like to hear about it. But I haven't found any papers on that. But anyway, it has been measured in multiple substances. And for all these liquid gas phase transition, the value that you measure is approximately 0 0.63, no matter what that point is. So that's already interesting. Now let me tell you about another system that has a critical phase transition, ferromagnets. Now you thought you came to hear about QFTs and I'm giving you all these different systems, but we'll, we'll get there. So in a ferromagnet, and this is an experiment I, I remember from eighth or ninth grade that we did, you can heat up a nice little ferromagnet with its north and its south pole. And at some point you hit the critical temperature and it stopped displaying its characteristic magnetic properties. It enters from the ordered magnetic phase into a disordered phase at the Curie temperature. And that is what is the critical temperature between the magnetic ordered phase and the disordered phase. In this system, the correlation length diverges just as we described before, as the temperature approaches the critical temperature. And it does so with the critical exponent, exponent nu, which is 0 0.63, which is the same as in the liquid gas transition. So this is an example of universality, namely the property that even if these two systems at the microscopic level are widely different, the gas phase, gas liquid phase transition and the ferromagnetic phase transition, they're still described by some universal properties in this macroscopic model by these critical exponents. So the takeaways from these two examples is that as you approach the critical point, the correlation length diverges and the system becomes scale invariant. And new, this power by which the correlation length diverges is one example of a critical expo exponent. There are other ones too. And one that will come up a little bit later in this talk is called, often called ADA. And that is the behavior of a two point correlation function in terms of how uh, for example, in think about the ferromagnet, you have little spin ups and downs. If they're separated by a distance r apart, the correlation between those spin up and downs in the system at a distant r behaves in a certain way that is characterized by this number uh, eta. And d here is the dimension, which you might as well set to three in this context. context. Okay, and there are also other critical coefficients, but these are the two ones that I'll think about in this talk. So, correlation length, how it diverges, and how at the critical point, the system is correlated. Now you say, why is it correlated? Why is there a distance behavior? You said that there's no scale invariant, there's the scale invariant, but what you notice is that there's no length scale inside that correlation function. There's no uh, mass or anything else that enters. Now it's been proposed, and this goes back many, many years, that at the critical point, these scale invariant systems are in fact described by further enhancement of symmetries, namely by these classes of conformal theories that I mentioned but haven't explained anything about yet. But these conformal field theories that I said corresponded to the peaks and valleys in the Q of T landscape. So that was why when I talked about this landscape in the first slides that I mentioned that maybe at some of these points here, these valleys up here, that could be the places that corresponded to boiling water. And another place in a different universality class corresponds to a certain phase transition uh, called the lambda point phase transition in helium-4. So those are points that are very different from our standard model, but are nonetheless physically relevant. And it gives you an idea of why we want to understand this entire space of possible theories and how to move around in it. Now at this point, I better say a little bit more about what we mean by quantum field theories and CFTs. So first, what is a quantum field theory? So a field theory is something that has fields and we uh, will assume that these fields depend locally on space and time. This is familiar from your classical ENM classes where you know that there are electric and magnetic fields and they define a vector value at every point in space and time. Now the classical fields of the field theory obey classical equations of motion. 
And in electromagnetism, those are, of course, Maxwell's equations. When we go quantum on these fields, these fields abstractly create particles out of the vacuum and they're able to annihilate them again. And if we're doing this in the context of Maxwell theory, those particles that we talked about are photons. What we'll focus on in this talk are relativistic quantum field theories. And relativistic here means that the theory has space-time translations, that they are rotationally invariant, and then that they are also invariant on the Lorentz transformations. So they're independent on which inertial frame we work in. So as you know well also from your electromagnetic experiences, when you change your inertial frame, you mix up your electric and magnetic fields. And it's therefore very convenient, and it'll come up a little bit later, that we can combine the electric and magnetic fields into what is known as the field strength. And the field strength is such that a time-space component is the electric field, and the space-space components of this tensor are the components of the magnetic field. We can write down a Lagrangian, which is basically the square of this field strength, and when you apply to that Lagrangian a variational principle or principle of least action, then you can derive Maxwell's equations precisely from the action that I showed you here. Now, without any matter, without any charged matter around, there are no interactions, and this therefore describes free Maxwell fields of which you know solutions such as electromagnetic radiation, so electromagnetic waves. Okay. So, as I said before, there are many different kinds of quantum field theories. There's QED that describes the interactions of electrons and positrons and photons. There's QCD that describes the strong force. It has gluons and quarks. There's the standard model of particle physics with all the little things that we know and love. And then the beyond the standard model physics with all the things that you can dream of discovering one day and understand better nature and how the universe began. One thing that may not be thought about so much as a field theory outside our field is general relativity that you use every day when you use your GPS. So general relativity is also a field theory. It's a classical field theory, but you can also regard it as a quantum field theory, at least for scales below the Planck scale. In that way, we refer to it often as an effective field theory. Now, I also mentioned these peaks and valleys that are the conformal field theories. So what are they? Well, in addition to the symmetries of a relativistic CF, uh, QFT, a CFT also has conformal boosts. Now what? I can't see what anybody else than Marcella is doing, but I can imagine it's something like this. Both the experts probably, and also everybody else. So for practical purposes of this talk, all you have to think about is that a conformal field theory is something that has scale invariance. While the opposite, a scale invariant theory being conformal invariant is not necessarily true, for all the purposes of what we're gonna do here, scale invariance will be what matters. So scale invariance, you say, our everyday experience is definitely not scale invariant. If I have a piece of glass, like my window over here, and I throw something hard at it, that means I'm interacting with this glass with a short time scale, it shatters. But if I sh interact with it at a longer time scale by just pushing it gently, it will actually bend a little bit, but not break. So it's time scale dependent. And if I wait thousands of years, my window will behave as a fluid. So things in our world is time scale dependent. And I've also heard some rumors that people's attention span over Zoom talks are also time dependent. I don't know if that's true. Anyway, you already uncovered two phenomena in this talk of scale invariance that was important and could be seen in a lab context. And that was the critical point of liquid gas phase transitions and ferromagnetic critical phase transition. And there are many other examples such as this. So my point being that scale invariant theories are relevant for real observable physical phenomena and therefore in itself is relevant to understand the peaks and the valleys in the landscape. In addition, they also serve as really light beacons just like peaks and valleys in real turbo maps do. So the first program I wanted to mention to you is this program called the Conformal Bootstrap, whose purpose is to find the CFTs and characterize them. How do they do this? Well, I'm not gonna go into detail, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of a flavor of it. 
And the point is that they look at observables. They don't look at Lagrangians or other things that may or may not exist for these theories, but they look at correlation functions, namely specifically four point correlation functions. They express them in two different ways as illustrated with these diagrams. These two different ways must agree and that imposes very non-trivial constraints on the theories. This is called the conformal bootstrap and also goes back to Polyakov and others from many, many years ago. But in recent years, it has found a new renaissance in part due to the numerical implementation of these methods and subsequently an enormous powerful set of tools that are more on the analytic side. So here's an example of how this numerical bootstrap works. What you should have in mind is some game you might have played as a kid, hopefully, which is called Battleship. Um, here it is in the fancy version where you actually have a, some game play. And here below it is in the version that I played as a kid, which was the pen and paper version. So each player sets up their battleships and then you, you call out some coordinates like B6 and you try to sink each other's ships. So this is how the game is played in the conformal bootstrap numerically. And suppose this plane here are these critical coefficients, the critical exponents that I explained before from the divergence of the correlation length and the two point correlation function in the system. So eta and nu. So you go in and you can start at a point where eta is zero and nu is a half. That turns out to correspond to a theory in which there are no interactions. So this is sort of a trivially boring point. But you could move a little bit away from that and go to your bootstrap equation and ask, does there exist a theory with say eta being uh, 0.1 and nu being 0.8? And it will go, Wah. you didn't find my destroyer ship? No, you put a cross, okay, no theory there. And then you continue until you find a place where you hit a metaphorical battleship that carves out a tiny little island around the value of eta equals 0 0.363 dot 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 and, and nu equals 0 0.63. Now that value is something that you immediately recognize as something around the value of the liquid gas phase transition and the ferromagnetic phase transition, exactly that critical postponement. And the model has a name in the context of statistical models of condensed matter system, it's, it's called the 3D icing model. And it is proposed to be a conformal theory that sits exactly at that point. And using these methods, uh, collaborators, Poland, Simon Stoffen, Kos, Vichy, and collaborators have been able to find the value of nu under these very simple crossing relation assumptions that I showed you before, that is many digits more precise than any Monte Carlo has been able to do. So that is an example of a result from the numerical conformal bootstrap. So I've talked about the peaks and the valleys, but as you see, and as you know, most of the landscape are slopes. The slopes indicate that they're non-conformal in the sense of having a scale dependence. And so we clearly also need ways to study such theories. And that leads me to the second program that I want to talk about here. The second fo program focuses on an observable called the scattering amplitude. The scattering amplitude is basically a probability that encodes particle scattering. The observable that experimentalists uh, study in scattering, pro in scattering experiments are the scattering cross sections. And those are calculated from an integral, a phase space integral over what I call the amplitude absolute value squared. So for those of you who are more familiar with quantum mechanics, think about how in quantum mechanics probability is proportional to the wave function squared. The analog here in a quantum field theory scattering context is that scattering cross sections, which really directly are the things that you measure, are proportional to a phase space integral over an amplitude squared. Traditionally, what you do when you want to calculate a scattering process is that you decide some model that you want to calculate this process in. It could be QED, if you want to study something like Compton scattering, if you want to study a process at the LHC, you would have to write down the Lagrangian for the standard model, possibly with some new physics included um, for beyond the, phys beyond the standard model physics. You start with that Lagrangian, you get some Feynman rules from it, which has a standard procedure for do. There are even programs where you just tell the program what your 
Lagrangian is, and it spits out the Feynman rules for you. And then you glue together these Feynman rules to find and write down all the Feynman diagrams that represent the scattering process that you want. You sum up all those diagrams, and that's your amplitude. So it's a very well-defined procedure. For any given one theory, you can calculate the physical observables this way. But on the other hand, the modern approach to amplitudes takes two different other avenues. One is to forget about the Feynman rules and the Lagrangians and use mathematical consistency conditions to derive new modern methods, more efficient methods than Feynman diagrams to calculate the amplitudes. The second is that we also reverse this program and use our understanding of the mathematical properties of the amplitudes to learn something about the space of possible theories that could generate such observables. We know that the assumptions of the theory will imply signatures of the amplitudes of their properties. Symmetries of the theory are inherited by symmetries of the amplitudes. We reverse this process and say, does there exist a theory with the following set of properties? This set of particles, this set of, of symmetry properties. If there are no amplitudes that have those properties, then there can't be any underlying theory. If there's a one family, parameter family of such, of such amplitudes, then that's indication that such a theory does exist with those properties and has one free parameter. So we reverse the traditional approach and go backwards from amplitudes to understanding where the theories could come from. So I want to give an example of this. And the example I want to motivate by starting with something that is a bit more familiar to, to most people, which is QED. So the interactions of electrons and positrons and photons. And then I'll take you from this point of familiarity into a more unknown space of nonlinear electrodynamics and certain properties um, that lie somewhere else in the landscape. But I'll take you through the path of this. So quantum electrodynamics uh, has the procedure, ha has the possibility of pair producing electrons and positrons at a scale of a, a order of the electron positron mass, which is half an MHV each. At that energy level, the fine structure constant that governs the strength of the interaction is about 1 over 37, 137. But as you go up in energy, the structure constant actually increases. So when I reach the masses of, say, Ws and Cs, the final structure constant is 1 over 27, and the coupling keeps increasing until I no longer trust perturbation theory. And I need something else to UV complete the theory. However, as I go down in energy, at some point I can no longer pair produce the electrons and positrons. The coupling gets very, very weak. And I end up, as I said, even for the standard model, just with something that is practically, that really is just free Maxwell theory. And as I mentioned, free Maxwell theory is something that is governed by a Lagrangian, that's the field strength squared. Now let's zoom in with our zoom application here to the low energy regime. Near that low energy regime, a little bit away from the point where we just have free Maxwell theory, we can describe the physics of interactions of photons through an effective Lagrangian that is known as the Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian. It has the form that the leading term here is the usual Maxwell term F squared. But then in addition, it also has a new term, which is F to the four, which is often referred to as light by light scattering. Now, light by light scattering, you say, how can that work? Light and photon is something that is supposed to interact with charged matter. Photons are not charged, so how can they interact with themselves? Well, it's not really what happens. What really happens is that they interact with each other through a loop. But since I can no longer physically pair produce the electron and positron at low energies, this is what the effective interaction look like, just like in familiar Fermi theory uh, that people might, be, might have heard about. So here is a picture of the landscape. I have QED. I go down to low energy, free Maxwell. I have Euler-Heisenberg at some level. And then there's another band of theories that lies over here. Now, this particular coefficient of the light by light, f to the four term, is determined by just having the electron. So it's determined by electron mass and the fine structure constant. But if I had another theory with the included, say, muons and other charged particles, I would change that coefficient. And you can abstractly think of having Lagrangians where these numbers that sit abstractly in front of f to the four, f to the six, f to the eight could be any number you would want. Among those classes of theories where I get to pick those coefficients are a very special class here illustrated with the red blob 
are theories that have a property called electromagnetic duality. I'm going to explain in a second what that means. And among those very special models are, is a model called the Born-Infeld model. So Born-Infeld model was introduced by Born and Infeld in 1934, motivated by the electron self-energy problem. The Lagrangian is something that has a square root. And if I set the magnetic field to zero, then I see that this square root is basically one minus some length scale, one over some length scale times the electric field squared, which means that this puts an upper bound on the electric field. And so for the electron self-energy problem, that would mean that you couldn't get an arbitrarily high energy as you approach a charged particle. And we know now that this is not the actual solution to the electron self-energy problem. But nonetheless, this action is interesting because it shows up in other modern applications. These coefficients that sit here, when you expand the square root, are some Wilson coefficients and such that this theory has an interesting property called electric magnetic duality. Essentially, and for the purpose of this talk, this means that it has a symmetry on the exchanges of the electric magnetic fields. This is familiar from the Maxwell's equations in vacuum, where if I have no matter, then, and I set the speed of light to one, then the Maxwell's equations, the free Maxwell equations are just symmetric, completely symmetric on the interchanges of the electric and magnetic field. But as you can see, the Lagrangian is not because that depends on the difference between the magnitude of the electric and magnetic fields. So when I interchange them, it changes the sign. This is why this is called a duality and not a symmetry. It's a symmetry of the equations of motion, but not of the action. But you would say, what is the physical implication of this in scattering amplitudes? It is that there's a rule of optical helicity conservation. It basically charge conservation, but for helicity. Helicity is the property of which way the spin of the particle points compared to the momentum. And in four dimensions, it can either point in the direction that the particle is going or in the opposite direction for a massless particle. And so it says that if I scatter in three photons with positive helicity, they come out with three photons as positive velocity. If I scatter in two with positive velocity, I have to conserve velocity. So what has to come out if it's all particles is three with positive velocity and one with negative. So charge conservation for velocity, so to speak. Now, one question we asked ourselves is why does Born Enfield in four dimensions have this electromagnetic duality? And is it only a classical feature or can it persist in quantum corrections? If I wanted to study such questions using traditional Feynman rule methods, then I would immediately be in trouble because the F to the four term generates a Feynman rule with about 50 terms, while the F to the sixth term generates Feynman rules with up to about 6,000 6, terms. So to investigate the leading quantum corrections to this theory with say six external photons, I would need diagrams of this sort here with a triangle that has 125,000 terms and 3,000 terms or so in the diagram with a blob in the middle. And that is clearly prohibitive. Even if I could put it on a computer, I wouldn't learn very much from the answer. So the modern methods allow us to bootstrap these answer and uh, these, these terms and understand them from a, from a more fundamental point of view and actually calculate these amplitudes. So let me just give a very brief technical answer to the question of why does born infeld have electromagnetic duality? And if the experts are interested, we can talk more about it later. So born infeld turns out to also be the action of vectors on D3 brains in the low energy limit of string theory. It turns out that this implies that the dual M2 brain has an ordinary U1 symmetry, which is an honest symmetry of the action. The question is, can you oxidate this lower dimensional symmetry back up to four dimensions? This is a very non-trivial question, but we could answer it using some novel recursive amplitude techniques and prove that in this case, it actually does happen. Now, you could also ask if this is only a classical feature, because I said this is a symmetry of the equations of motion, not of the action, so it has no business really being a symmetry at the quantum level, but nobody studied it before because it was prohibitively hard because of the Feynman rule approach. But using the modern methods, we were able to make exact calculations of n photon amplitudes with one loop at one loop and show that the anomalies in quantum theory were not there. There was no violation of the ENM duality in any amplitude that we could calculate. So this gives some intriguing evidence 
uh, that the metric magnetic duality persists at one order, but is still not a proof. And this was with my students, Mario Sajjantunis, Callum Jones, and Sridhar Puranjati. Now you might not care. I'm somewhere away from QED on some other branch with some very special weird electromagnetic duality problems. One reason we care is that this is a prototype symmetry that show up in supergravity theories. And if you want to understand low energy quantum gravity for various purposes, even for black hole purposes, we have to understand also quantum aspects of the duality symmetries. And there are certain examples in the fields where this comes in and is very relevant. So I took you on this trip, this little hike down the mountain from QED, Euler Heisenberg, and into this other space of theories with very special properties. And I can take it even further through some symmetry, supersymmetry branch into what is called the dirac born enfeld theory, which is a theory of Goldstone mode from spontaneously broken symmetry or translational symmetries. So suppose that I have this sheet of paper right here. It breaks the translational symmetry transfers to it. And there are Goldstone modes that arise from that spontaneously broken symmetry, which are massless modes that live on my piece of paper, so to speak. This is governed by a special action that is called the direct one enthralled action. Now I can go ahead and I can characterize these kind of Goldstone model actions in a landscape of possible theories where there's scalar type of Goldstone modes or fermion type of Goldstone modes. And this was work initiated for scalars um, by a group led by Cliff Chung and Yara Chenga and their collaborators. And we extended that and put it on a firmer footing in what is now known as the soft bootstrap approach to study effective field theories for low energy modes that arise from spontaneously broken symmetries. One point you see here is the direct one infill action I mentioned before. Another point are nonlinear sigma models for which pine physics and chiral perturbation theory is one. Other models over here is Akula Volkov that involved Gostinos from spontaneously broken supersymmetry. There's the NJL model for as a low energy version of Q QCD for mesons and hadrons and old fashioned version for, for that um, and, and, and many others. But what you think you see in these so-called landscape, it doesn't matter so much on the axis, what these are supposed to illustrate is that the points in this landscape where theories live and the point, points in this landscape where there are none. And the most interesting theories live exactly on the border of this landscape of, of triviality and failure. So all these effective field theories that I've just described, they live somehow here far down on the slopes in the landscape. The landscape is incredibly rich and I've tried to illustrate to you several different examples of it, but there's much, much more out there. We've had boiling water, QCD, I mentioned helium-4, there's pion scattering and quantum gravity, the Rackborn infill, the standard model and beyond. It's rich and it's vast. There's a lot of relevant physics here and there are many opportunities to explore more. So I want to finish this talk by thanking my collaborators and showing you who they are. There's Maria Hadjuantinis, who was my graduate student finishing last year and who's now a postdoc at Nordida. Callum Jones, who just uh, defended back in April and is a postdoc virtually now at UCLA. Shruti Paranchape is graduating this coming spring. Aiden is a third year student. Matt Mitchell is a second year student uh, he worked with a little bit with Sam Grella at Arizona, and Sam was, of course, a Chicago student uh, before Matt came to, to Michigan, and then a postdoc on Heng Chi. These days, in Corona times, it's also important to acknowledge your home collaborators, because without them staying healthy, talks like this have a different feature, namely people crawling on you. I have my fourth year collaborator at home, who has now entered the stage where she's ready to go to conferences, as you can tell. My second year is starting to explore a stack of open strings. My first year student is definitely not pulling her load yet. And we're talking a little bit about how to interact during Zoom calls. She seems to take this pose every time. So we're talking about how to present herself properly. There was a Nobel Prize awarded this week. And I have to say that my kids watched the video of Andre Guess inspirationally twice. And this morning, my daughter asked if I could read this book, which some may recognize as, I think, the 2004 particle data booklet for her real quick. So I want to thank you for joining me into this hike of landscape of quantum field theories. If you want to read more, there's a little review I wrote to the summer 
that gives two level introduction to both the fields of bootstrap and amplitudes, one for non experts experts and one with many more details and examples for for the experts or those who are interested in seeing more details. So I want to thank you again for the opportunity to tell you about these fun and exciting avenues of discovery and um, and I would be very happy to talk with anybody again after after the talk. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Henriette, for, for this uh, um, very exciting hike that you allow us to accompany you through uh, today. And I will now, um, I guess the best way could be if um, people put their hands up on, on the side of the participants so I can um, ask them to speak in some order or to ask you questions. So, make comments. If you put your hand up, I guess I will see it just on my side of participants. Please. Uh, yeah, Dan, please. Hi, this is Son. So, um, how, how unique is born infer theory from the point of view of electromagnetic duality? Um, but the, it's not a, at all unique from just the point of electric magnetic duality. It's, it's actually known that there's a whole one function worth of families that have in four dimensions that have electromagnetic duality. So if you want to ask what characterizes born infield, there are actually a number of different answers. One answer is that it is the unique theory that can be supersymmetrized to a fermion that has vanishing soft limits, namely the Akula-Bulkov fermions. But that criteria that they have vanishing soft, theorem, soft theorems is actually important for that uniqueness. You could also say it's a unique theory that connects through supersymmetry to the direct one infant scalars, uh, which have a vanishing soft theorem, which is a little stronger than that of the fermions in Akula-Bulkov namely that they get an enhancement because not only are they the modes that break the translational symmetries, but there's also an inherent enhanced symmetry from the fact that you have broken the rotational symmetries that, that enter and mix, mix up with the brain directions. There's also a funny other aspect that I don't understand that well, but it is, it is a theory that has some unique bifringence properties in nonlinear electrodynamics. And then there's the third characterization of fifth or whichever number we count, which is that it has certain recursive property of vanishing behavior and a multi-soft limit. But I think that is equivalent to the supersymmetric statement that I said. So in some ways from electromagnetism, it is definitely not unique. Um, but from the aspect of how it's connected in the web of other theories, it is. Thank you. Uh, Sab? Hi, Henriette. Hey, Sab. Um, hey, that was a great colloquium. Um, I've actually climbed Mount Massive, so, <laughs> so I really appreciated the first, uh, the first slide. Um, so I have uh, actually had a couple of questions, but let me just ask one right now. So you were discussing mainly um, in the scattering amplitude discussion, it was mainly non-interacting long distance theories like Maxwell or deformations of Maxwell. If you, if you looked at non-trivial conformal field theories, like non-abelian Young-Mills and applied to scattering amplitude approaches, could you relate that to correlation functions and bootstrap in, in a very direct way? So there are definitely approaches like this that I didn't talk about. Um, so one of the most common places that people use amplitude method is in fact a conformal field theory. And normally you can't do this because in a conformal field theory, as you know well, of course, you don't have the asymptotic states that you need to define the amplitude. But in the most famous case of n equals four super young mills, you can get around this point by deforming it slightly, either going on the Coulomb branch or by just going into dimensional regularization and then going back. So n equals four super young mills, as, as I think you, you also know well, is, is one of the cases where a lot of these amplitudes methods are developed and honed and then taken into other aspect, uh, areas of the, of the theory space. So one of the things that people are in fact doing is looking at um, Mellon transforms from ADS and then taking flat space limits and connecting that to amplitudes. So I think that is the, what you had more in mind, is, is that correct? Yeah, I think that was the, yeah, that was the, the idea. 
the Merlin amplitude seems to be the right connection between those two, those two things. In fact, I mean, I think that the work recently by Pufu and also in collaboration with Michael Green and others that work on using bootstrap amplitudes and localization methods uh, combined into finding correlators, taking flat melon transforms using flat space limit and then telling us something about higher derivative corrections in effective supergravity is in fact exactly such an approach. Um, other questions? Henrietta, while people maybe think of other questions, I was thinking, so there are a lot of uh, um, young postdocs that are looking at, uh, you know, the, the calculations done and the, um, you know, the um, developments with, with amplitudes. What would be um, your kind of generic picture about where are the most interesting, uh, you know, areas in your, in your hike to explore? So I think there are many, many different interesting directions right now. So, so I think it's an incredibly powerful common idea in these two approaches that I talked about, that you focus on the physical observables and bootstrap back from them. Whether you want to use this to find amplitudes that you can calculate by other means, or the whether you use it as a method to explore the landscape um, and possibilities of theories, is, it, it's just a very powerful idea. And that powerful idea is definitely being implemented also on the phenomenology side. So in the standard model effective field theory, you can use these amplitude techniques to characterize higher derivative operators. It's very powerful for this. And there are various identities and observations people have seen with certain vanishing properties of amplitudes, say, that can be explained from a simple amplitude approach of saying, this is the only Lorentz invariant local structure, blah, 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 you can have. And this is why certain non-renormalization theorems and so on come about. So, so there's certainly been work in that direction and, and people like Earl Smart, me and, and Nathaniel Craig are doing a lot of work in that direction. So if you're interested in standard model effective field theory, that is definitely an interesting direction that this is, this is going in also. Then there's a question of, of if you're more on the formal side of, of, of quantum, what, what makes a good quantum field theory? So right now I talk about this landscape and it's a little bit of a bottom up approach of saying, well, everything goes, but then there's a question of what is actually a good theory when I keep going up in energy. So if we're talking specifically about gravity, then many of us expect and think that string theory is the right answer at the quantum level. But there's an, there's a, there's a, there's an approach now to say, how can you understand if there, if, if there are some simple principles that you can implement at low energy to say that what is the, what, what kind of properties a, a good UV theory should have. So there are things that go under the names of weak gravity conjecture. Um, there are other, other ways of bootstrapping things down in terms of if, say, effective coefficients in these theories, what signs they should have coming out of basic principles and Basically, one of the goals you have is, is narrow down and say, what are the only allowed possible UV constructions that you could possibly have to these theories? This goes under the name sometimes of, of the UV completable theories and the swampland. And the swampland are the ones that don't come from anywhere good, but you can still write them down at low energy and be fine. But they don't have anywhere to go when you go up in energy. And I think those are very interesting questions, trying to narrow things down. Um, I have a project that has some of that flavor right now, which has to do with the double copy constructions. It's very different from what I talked about here, but it has some of that flavor and perspective. So, so uh, I think that the, the, short, the short answer is there are many, many different directions you can pursue and you should learn your basic techniques and, and, uh, and practice and not being afraid of doing calculations. Okay. I think Sab wanted to ask another question. Is that right, Sab? You're moving, so I don't know. If <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just pacing. Uh, I mean, this question may or may not be appropriate for, for the colloquium, but um, so, you, so you discussed DBI and, and born infall. This is beautiful nonlinear uh, version of electro, electromagnetism. Um, if I were in three dimensions, then as you know well, I could dualize from Maxwell to, to a scalar. Yes. And, and my Dirac action and my born infall action should be dual to each other. Exactly. But, but I think in one frame, in, in, the, in the scalar frame, I would have said the theory is fixed by a nice symmetry, nonlinear Lorentz, and, and yes. that, that symmetry will fix it. But yes. I don't know what the analogous statement is in, in for, for the gauge field. Is there this some... Is, this is exactly, I think this is exactly the, the answer that we gave 
uh, that I, I went a little fast over because it's a little technical for a colloquium, so I'm really happy that you ask. So exactly when I said you start with a free brain, why does it have electromagnetic duality? It's not your S duality because it's implemented more at a level of something like an R symmetry. It's a U1 under which the mm -hmm. photons are charged. But it's not a level of the action, it's at the level of the equation of motion. Why is this? So as you say, another way actually, and this is also to Dan's question, another way of characterizing born infill is when I dimension and reduce it to one dimension, I get two scalars instead. But if I just dimensionally reduce naively, and this is, this, you can find this is, this is basically textbook stuff, then my vector becomes a scalar. But, but I, to actually see the proper scalar configuration, I have to include a Lagrange multiplier and integrate out the vector and be done, and that scalar, that, that Lagrange multiplier becomes my new scalar. Does that make sense? So this mm -hmm. is how you go from the D3 brain action with a vector to a D2 brain action with two scalars. You have mm -hmm. to introduce the Lagrange multiplier and, mul and integrate it out. Then you use that the D2 brain and the M2 brain actually have exactly the same action. So stepping up, step back, when I dimension reduce from D3 to D2, I gain an extra transverse direction. That means I have a spontaneously broken symmetry that has to be a Goldstone mode. And that was what you said was the nonlinearly realized symmetry of that action that you uniquely identify. So another way of identifying born and felt is that action that dimensionally reduced has that enhanced soft behavior of the amplitudes of those scalars in one dimension lower. Okay, but it has two scalars. And from what I said, only one of them is special. And that means only one linear combination of the two helicities from four dimensions has to be special. But because the D2 action is the same as the M4 action and the M4 action has an extra direction, that tells you that those two scalars are exactly on the same footing because they, trans they correspond individually to the two transverse direction that the M2 has as opposed to the D2. And because that means that there's an SO2 symmetry that, transfer, that transforms those extra directions for the M2, that means that that's the U1 on the brain if I complexify the scalars. And so electromagnetic duality in four dimension implies that the M2 has this U1. But you should of course say that the U1 the M2, of course, has that U1 independently of that. So the question really is, does that U1 oxidate back up to four dimensions? And that doesn't always happen. But in this case, it does happen because it turns out that there's nothing that could violate electromagnetic duality in four dimension that when written in 3D kinematics vanishes. And that's what we could prove with a recursive approach. So long technical question to, to, answer, to your question, but that allowed me to explain what I actually meant by that slide. So thank you. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Clay? Yeah, hi. Um, I have a kind of question about uh, the amplitude type bootstrap that you were doing. So in, in the case of the conformal bootstrap, there's kind of a miraculous coincidence, which is that, you know, if you make a plot of a small number of mathematical consistency conditions and their exclusion regions, you find that uh, physical theories that we actually care about like the 3D Ising model or other simple conformal field theories happen to live at the edge of these simple uh, exclusion plots. Um, is there any analog of that in, uh, in the amplitude uh, uh, approach? Are, are, there, are there a simple mathematical consistency conditions that you impose and you see, right. aha, this theory that I cared about is actually, uh, is actually pointed to by that? A little bit. So in the plots that I showed here, I said that these special, sometimes called exceptional uh, effective field theories, do, do live in a sense on an edge between where the mathematical consistency condition fails and where it's trivially satisfied. So that has a little bit of the flavor of the type of bootstrap where you use a single correlator and you get these plots where you get definitely excluded and then maybe, right? Uh, and where you see that yeah, 3D icing modeling lives at this. So ab above the lower dot, dot, dot in this picture it yeah. is allowed? It no, no. Yeah, so above it's allowed, but it's allowed in a sort of trivial way. So, so let me say what the, the consistency con condition here is. So the consistency condition is that you want to construct an amplitude that has a vanishing soft theorem. And the, how much it's vanishing when I take the momentum to be small 
is the degree on the horizontal axis. So zero means that it actually doesn't vanish, it's order one. One means that it, it vanishes linear in the momentum, two means quadratically in momentum, three cubic and so on. Uh, on the vertical axis, I have the mass dimension of the lowest dimensional operator. And so, for example, if I have phi to the fourth theory in four dimensions, that is dimensionless coupling. And so that's why it lies at the origin in this plot. And of course, it also has non-vanishing soft behavior. If I take a nonlinear sigma model as, as for pion scattering, um, then the coupling, this is a two derivative coupling. So the four dimensional, inter, so the four point interaction has a, is quadratic in mass dimension. And that's what, that's what this says here. So it's negative mass dimension two. And those amplitudes are required to vanish linearly in momentum. This is, um, this is what happens in chiral perturbation theory or uh, a CP1 model and things like that. Um, so the criterion is that I go in and I ask, does there exist a model where the mass dimension of the lowest dimensional coupling is say two and the amplitude vanishes at quadratic order as the momentum is taken soft? And the mathematical consistency tells you, no, that does not exist. There's no point here. But if you only wanted a linear order and an extra soft momentum, you end up at the nonlinear sigma models. You can do the same thing. You know, going up in mass dimension, you end up uniquely at DBI, uh, but there's nothing at that mass dimension at higher. So in this sense, these guys live on the edge. The reason that everything above that line is trivial is that as I go up in mass dimension in the, in the coupling or, or down, if you wish, then I can just put more and more derivatives on each field, which means that the vanishing soft limit is achieved tri trivially. And so those theories certainly exist, but they're not of particular interest. So the real exceptional and interesting theories are really the ones that in, in a certain sense live on the edge of this plot. But I, I, I think it's still a little bit different from the conformal bootstrap, because once you do the multi-correlator approach, as for the icing model where you really narrow down on the island, you're not so much on the edge anymore, right? You really, you're carving out an island. Maybe no, I think that's only if you zoom in on that little neighborhood. If you made a plot of a larger region, you would still see that there's just a, there's a whole open set that's uh, like a semi-infinite set. That's, well, that's true, that's true. But we haven't found anything on that edge of that semi-infinite space, right? Well, okay. We could have a discussion about that. Yeah. I mean, do you think there's stuff there? Almost certainly, yeah. But on an edge in any way? No, probably not. Okay. So I would like, so we have a still, um, um, so for Clay and others, so we, we have arranged to have an open time until five for coffee and tea, but maybe we should uh, kind of, in view of the time, uh, make a big uh, virtual applause. So I would make it a real applause for, for uh, the water. And so, thank you so much. And again, as I said, everybody's welcome to disconnect if they want to. Um, we, we, we really enjoy so much uh, the seminar, the colloquium, sorry. And uh, so for those who are interested in staying and, and talking more with, with uh, Henrietta, we are all going to stay here until five. Okay, so Clay, if you want to keep talking, now it's okay, please. <laughs> I, I just, uh, or anyone else, I mean, for that matter. I just wanted to kind of give some closure. And uh, I see here that some people are thanking you 